All righty. Let's get into the world of mechanics of deformable bodies, where everything sits still, right, for the most part. Let me get the sign-in sheet started. Um, let me see something real quick. Okay. So last time, if you remember, we um, we looked at the concept of a shear and moment diagram because that was really trying to fill the gaps on um, uh, everything we needed to cover before beams, uh, before we d d uh, cover stresses and beams because we've covered moments of inertia and we've covered uh, shear and moment diagrams. Now we can actually get into bending stresses. Now I figure I'll go ahead and ask. Um, I did a or I did give you all homework, homework four. Uh, it's due Tuesday, so this is sort of our last class period before it's turned in. Does anybody have any questions about it? Everybody good? Okay. All right, sign-in sheets right there. Okay. All right. <clears throat> I want to take my time with this because this is a really important derivation and I want to sort of make sure that everybody is following what's going on because we're about to derive arguably one of the most used and fundamental equations in this whole class. Um, and not just this whole class, but I mean I'd argue any engineer who's designing something that is going to be bent they're going to use this. So um, I, I really think this is important and I'm going to take my time with it. So we're going to look at bending stresses in beams and we're going to uh, go through this step by step and derive the uh, equation for it. Now I've mentioned this stuff before but beams are one of the most fundamental elements in all of engineering. I mean any system that's being subjected to loads usually in some form or another has something in it that's being bent. And therefore, we need to understand the stresses that are generated by bending something. Um, now, when, with beams, it should be noted that more often than not, when you're bending something, you're not only uh, generating bending moment, but you're generating shears as well. Um, so there's going to be both. Um, we're going to handle the shear stresses later. I'm not saying it's not important. It is very important. We're just going to handle them one at a time, and we're going to start off with bending stresses. Bending stresses, by and large, uh, for the most part, uh, dictate the size of a, of a given beam. That's usually how engineers are sizing beams. That's why the equation is so fundamental. <clears throat> now, let's just go back to fundamentals. When I have a beam subjected to whatever loads, point loads, distributed loads, whatever, and I cut an arbitrary section through that using a samurai sword or a lightsaber if you're a sci-fi fan, you know, what have you. Um, be, if I'm looking at this two-dimensionally, I generate, at most, three unknown components of load inside this system. Okay, um, Why do I get three unknown components? Because of my three equations of equilibrium. I have sum of forces in the x direction, sum of forces in the y direction, and sum of moments. Um, all those must equal zero. So that dictates that if I cut through that, um, through that beam, that there must be at most three components inside that section that are, um, uh, that are resisting those loads. Now, again, some of them might be zero, but I'm just saying uh, at most you've got three unknowns. <coughs> now, as we'll see in a moment, no pun intended, um, when we look at sum of forces in the x direction, for a, for a beam like this, that would be looking at uh, axial forces. Now, they generate normal stresses. But we've already seen that, right? Sigma equals P over A. We, we've seen that, okay? Bending moments are also going to generate normal stresses, but we don't know what those are yet. Um, shear forces generate shear stresses. That's, that seems to make sense. We're going to talk about that later. Right now I'm concerned more about that, uh, that bending moment. Okay. <coughs> so in order to do this, I'm, I'm going to make some assumptions. Okay. The first thing I'm going to assume is linear elastic behavior. So everything's going to follow Hooke's law and everything's going to be linear. So um, that's going to make my life a little easier. Do beams always behave that way? No, but you got to walk before you can run. So we're going to start off with this. Um, if you take a course, let's say, in reinforced concrete design, we recognize the stages of a beam's behavior uh, right at the very beginning of the course. And um, one of the things we start learning is how do you um, figure out when a beam starts to crack? And then after, how, how do you determine a beam's capacity after it's cracked and, and all that? So it's, uh, 
there's a there's a progression of load that you have to to assess, <laughs> and that and, and all those assumptions that we use incorporate some uh, estimates of nonlinear behavior. But that's again that's for later days. All right, strain compatibility. That's basically an assumption that states that um, all our deformation is proportional from the centroid, and you can go down to any lab and and uh, and go down and test a beam, and you'll find that this happens. And our and our derivation, I think, will bear a lot of this out uh, here in a second. Um, we're also going to consider small deflections. Now that um, that might not make a whole lot of sense. Um, it's just something that's sort of underlying in the background of what it is that we're talking about. I'm t uh, when I say small deflections, I mean first order behavior. And the easiest way I can describe first order behavior is uh, the difference between first order and second order, I should say, is let's say I'm standing on top of uh, a mountain, okay? And Austin doesn't like me very much, and he decides to shove me, okay? Now, now if he shoves me, I'm going to want to fall over, but maybe I can catch myself, you know, okay? Now, let's imagine the same thing happens, but instead I'm wearing an 80-pound backpack, okay? It's going to be a little harder for me to keep upright, right? Now, here's why, okay? When Austin shoves me, I go like this, right? Now what happens right here? The backpack is now off center, right? So a force times a distance creates moment, right? That moment causes more deflection, which in turn causes more moment, which causes more deflection, which causes more moment, which causes more deflection. See how it builds upon itself? That's why you get that sort of whoa, 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 whoa type feeling. You, you see what I mean? Okay, that, that's a second order effect, okay? And you have to consider second order effects when you look at stability, things like buckling and whatnot in, in large structures and, and complex components, you, you have to consider that. For now, we're just going to consider first order behavior. In other words, that the equilibrium before and after deflections is maintained. And that's pretty reasonable because, you know, think about like this. Let's say there's this table and I'm sitting in the middle of the table. Now, it obviously deflects, but I'm assuming right now that the reactions, you know, if I weigh, you know, X amount of pounds, half that goes here and half that goes here, that doesn't change before and after the deflection. Make sense? That's, that's one of the assumptions uh, I'm making now. <coughs> so far so good? Okay. <coughs> now, we're going to treat the problem as follows using those assumptions. So I've got here a beam that's being supported, subjected, subjected to some loads, and the beam like if I cut a section and look at it, it's got some arbitrary shape. It could be an I-beam, it could be an angle, it could be whatever, you know. I'm, I'm just assuming it looks like whatever, okay. Now I've got this coordinate system, X and Y. I've got the Y axis at the very beginning of the beam. I've got the X axis going right through the centroid. Make sense? So this is right here, that's Y equals zero. Make sense? This would be positive Y values, this would be negative Y values. Everybody okay with that? Okay, all right. So we have this beam. It's arbitrary cross-section. It's subjected to these loads. Now, I'm subjecting it to axial loads and bending moments because those are the ones that generate normal stresses, okay? Now, we know that they're going to cause normal stress, but the question is how much, okay? Now, I'm assuming that the beam's response is linear, and I've got two unknowns. So what's the equation of a line? Y equals mx plus b or something like that? So I'm proposing that the stress is something like that, okay? In other words, that the stress is a constant plus a constant times y. Why am I doing it times y? Because I'm assuming the stress varies in this direction, okay? So you can think uh, my plus b if you want to think of it like that, okay? So those constants, I don't know what those are yet, okay? So I've got two unknown constants, a c1 and a c2. But I have two known quantities. I know I'm putting some axial force on this section, and I know I'm putting some bending moment on this section. So if I've got two equations and two unknowns, that's a perfect problem for a mathematician or an engineer to solve. Make sense? Okay, all right. So here's our function, and we're going to try and solve for those constants. Okay? This is basically the equation of a line. Okay? So two equations, two unknowns, we're going to solve this out. Let's take a look at, at how we're going to do this. All right? So I'm going to cut myself out a little slice of this, of this beam. So here's just this you know, little slice, you know, a, a dy tall slice, you know, a little differential slice. So would you agree that this little slice has got some area, maybe dA, some little area of that slice? Make sense? Now, 
there's going to be some stresses on that um, on that uh, on that uh, that slice. Some stress. Would you agree that if I took the stress on that slice times the area, that would give me the force, right? Remember, stress equals force over area, so if I flip and multiply, if I take the stress times the area, that gives me the force. So this D, dp, I'm saying that is the differential force on that slice, and it's just sigma dA. Make sense? Now, if I want to get a moment, what is a moment? It is a force times a distance. So the difference between this and this, the moment on, you know, contributed by this slice is the force times the moment arm, which is y. Does that make sense? Pretty straightforward, right? <clears throat> now, so I've got these expressions for dp and dm, and I'm going to take my time with this, okay? I have an assumption for what sigma looks like, right? I assumed that sigma was this, this c1 plus c2 times y. Sound good? So, plug and chug. So, dp is sigma dA, and dm is sigma y dA. So, here's sigma, okay? Now, that's the differential force and the differential moment on that slice. If I integrate about the whole area or along the whole area, that's going to give me the total force. That's going to give me the total moment. Make sense? So let's take the top one. So I'm integrating this. Okay. So if I integrate dp, I'm integrating c1 plus c2y times dA, right? Now if I've got the integral of one function plus another function, I can split it up into two integrals, right? And then if I've got constants, I can pull those out, right? So I propose that what I did from here to here is I said, you know, one integral plus the other, and then I factored out the constants. So C1 times this integral plus C2 times that integral. Make sense? Okay. What about dm? Same story. Okay, so plug in the, um, the, the sigma. Now I've got sigma times y, so instead of this, I've got C1 times y plus C2 times y squared. Everybody okay with that? All right. Integrate. Split it up into two integrals, factor out the constants. Everybody okay with this? Okay. Now, so here's what I got. Everybody okay with this? Now, look at these integrals. Pay attention to them. What about this one? The integral of dA. What is that? That's the area. We already did that, right? That's why we did that first, so that you would recognize what those integrals are. What is the integral of y squared dA? That's the moment of inertia, right? That's what this was. Remember that second moment of area. We have a name for it. We call it the moment of inertia. We, we spent all that time calculating it because I told you it was important in bending. There you go, right? Makes sense. This integral of y dA, what about that? Well, that was related to the centroid, right? Remember that? But where did we put the centroid? Or where do we put our axes? We put them right through the centroid. So the centroid is at y equals zero. So this whole integral is zero. Make sense? Everybody okay with that? Well, how, how do you calculate a centroid? Remember this? It was, um, remember you, uh, to calculate a centroid, actually, oh, let me do it on the screen. That way everybody can see it. To cal calculate a centroid, you would take the integral of y dA over the integral of dA. But that's just the integral of y dA over the area. It's kind of like saying sum of a y over sum of a. Because this, that's just the area of the whole thing. Make sense? Everybody good? No, that, that's good stuff. All right, so does this make sense? So if I've got that the integral of dA is the area, the integral of y squared dA is the moment of inertia, and then because I put my coordinate axes at the centroid, this is zero, I can take, let's take this one, c1 times the area plus c2 times zero, that's this, right? c1 times zero plus c2 times the moment of inertia, now we've got our constants, right? Make sense? So plug and chug, and there you go, all right? Pretty straightforward, isn't it? I propose that the total stress 
that you can get in a section that's subjected to axial loads and bending moments is P over A plus MY over I. The P over A, that's the axial force component. That's what we already know. Plus MY over I. And there you go. Okay? The Y is measured from the centroid. Okay? So you find your centroid. I propose that due to bending moment, you have no stresses at your centroid. Okay? The farther you get away from your centroid, the worse your bending stresses get. So that's what Y is. M is your moment. I is your moment of inertia. And there you go. Sigma equals MY over I is one of the most fundamental equations that an engineer will use. Okay? Just bar none. All right. <clears throat> Does anybody have any questions about this? Now, I, I'm going to go ahead and tell you before, before I open the floor. This derivation, the way that I did it, is different than the way your book does it. But I think it's a little more straightforward. But that's just me. Any questions? Okay. <clears throat> All right. So if I don't have any axial load, if P equals zero, then there's your bending stress formula. Fundamental. Okay. The, the formula tends to make sense when you think about it. I mean, if I take a beam and bend it, the top, you know, let's say I bend it like this, then the top of the beam is seeing compression, the bottom of it is seeing tension, right? The bottom of it's wanting to stretch apart, the top of it's wanting to push together. And that's what the formula is telling us. And, you know, if I've got a positive bending moment on this section, anything above the centroid is being compressed. Anything below is being stretched, right? So compression and tension. Make sense? Pretty straightforward. Now, another thing to point out, where are the largest stresses on this section? Just looking at it, either at the top or at the bottom. Make sense? So just by that, that uh, recognition, I can try and determine, you know, what are the maximum bending stresses that a given section is going uh, to see. Now, now let, let's be honest about something, okay? What, um, what I'm doing here is I'm trying to be sort of general about it. But if I have a beam that's, let's say, let's say something like a 2 by 4 okay? Now, if I take a 2 by 4 and bend it, the nice thing about a 2 by 4 is that it is symmetric, right? It's symmetric about either direction. So if I bend it, I'm really going to get the same stresses on the top and bottom. It's just one's going to be in compression, one's going to be in tension, right? Make sense? So if your section is symmetric, then, then this magnitude and this magnitude are going to be equal. But if it's not symmetric, I mean, we had an example, what was it, I think it was like example 17, where we had a cross section that was crazy, it had triangles and holes and semicircles and whatnot. Then if you've got a section that's not symmetric, then you have to treat each set, uh, side differently. You're going to get a different stress on the top than you are at the bottom. Does that make sense? Okay, all right. <coughs> now, let's think about this. Sigma equals my over i. So I is the moment of inertia, okay? If I divide I by this distance or this distance, and let's keep in mind, what is this distance? It's the distance from the centroid to what we call the extreme fiber. You know, think from the centroid to the way, way, way tippy, tippy top of the beam or from the centroid to the, you know, as, as low as we can get, right? We call that extreme fiber distance, okay? If we take this moment of inertia, which is a section property, and divide it by C, which is also a section property, it's a distance on the section, then we can calculate what's called a section modulus. And a section modulus is basically just the moment of inertia divided by C, divided by that extreme fiber distance. And th the reason why that's convenient is I can just calculate my sigma max directly by just saying M over S. Pretty straightforward. Yes, sir. Wait, what do you mean? Yeah. Oh, what is, okay. Really sure okay, all right. Okay, all right. So you're going to test my 3D art skills. Let's see what I can come up with. Okay. Let me see what I can come up with. All right. Okay, so let's say I have a beam, right? And... Let's say here's the support, right? Okay. Now, let's say I samurai sword through a given cross-section, right? 
So that's going to look something like, you know, cutting through it like this, right? Make sense? So I cut through it, and then I'm running out of room here, so I'm going to have to do a little bit of erasing here. All right, sound good? Okay, now, would you agree that the centroid is probably going to be like somewhere about like that? Make sense? Okay, I propose that if I take this beam and I bend it like so, that I propose that the, everything above that is going to be seeing compression. So it's going to kind of, you know, go like this. Make sense? And everything below is going to be experiencing tension. And so that's going to sort of go like this. Does that make sense? I'm doing my best to do the 3D art. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've got folks here that want to make fun of my handwriting, and then <laughs> I'm kidding. I couldn't help it. <laughs> no, it's fine. <laughs> No, but what we're getting at, okay, so this blue dotted line, that's, imagine the beam is running, you know, you know, like this. So here's the beam. And it's being subjected to, you know, all, all sorts of different types of loads. You know, so whatever, right? And I cut through a given section, right? I'm cutting through a section. Okay, the centroid is probably going to be somewhere about, you know, maybe like right here. And I'm proposing that the bending stress is doing this. Does that make sense? Basically, yeah, that, that, this, this right here, the blue dash line is where the centroid is. This is where I samurai sorted and or lightsabered through the section. So along that cut, Everything above that is going to be compression. Everything below that is going to be tension. Does that make sense? That's a good question to ask, and I want to make sure everybody's visualizing that. Everybody good? Okay. Any, any other questions? This is good stuff. Okay. Here, I'm going to erase this. Okay. Now this is what I was saying earlier, that if the section is symmetrical, then the stresses on the top are going to be the stresses on the bottom. But if not, then you need to be careful. So what I like to do is say, okay, here's the stress on the top, and then here's the stress on the bottom. So I'll say C top and C bottom. Make sense? We'll start off by doing symmetric sections, and then we'll handle, well, what if it's not symmetric later? All right. Sound good? Okay. So what I want to do is I want to go back to some examples and try and tie this all together, okay? Um, and we're going to have this one here in a second. But I, I want to go back to some stuff that we did earlier. So if you refer back to examples 18 and 19, which if you recall, examples 18 and 19, those were the shear and moment diagrams that we did, okay? So remember, when we did a shear and moment diagram, we just said, here's a beam subjected to some loads. We never looked at what the beam looks like. Okay, let's actually look at that. Let's say the beam was made out of wood, and here were its dimensions, 3 inches wide by 10 inches tall. If this is the beam, will the beam behave satisfactorily? And we'll assume that the allowable stress in the wood is 4,000 PSI. So let's see if the beam behaves like we would uh, prefer. Make sense? In other words, is it behaving satisfactorily? Are the stresses less than 4,000 PSI? Everybody good? Okay. Give me a moment. I keep using that word. Give me a moment. All right. Okay. So let's go back to example uh, 18 and 19. So let me go back to 18. Okay, so here was example 18. Remember this? We went and drew the shear and moment diagram. And what was the maximum moment that we saw, the largest magnitude of moment? 
It was this right here, right? That was the largest magnitude. Now, whether or not it's being bent this way or bent this way really doesn't matter for this cross section uh, because in the end, all we really care about is the magnitude. Make sense? So 12,000 foot-pounds is the maximum moment for beam, I guess, beam number 18, if that makes any sense. For beam 19, 38,750 foot-pounds. Make sense? Okay. So let's look at example 20. So the first thing I'll do is I'll say from previous examples. Okay. So So I'll say, for example, 18, M max equals 12,000 foot-pounds. Okay. Now, M max is 12,000 foot-pounds, but I, I want you to think right off the bat, okay, um, we have an allowable stress that's PSI, right? Maybe what I ought to do is convert this to inch pounds. Now, how do I convert from foot pounds to inch pounds? Multiply by 12. Don't divide by 12. You multiply by 12. So this is there we go. OK, example 19. Uh, 38,750. What happened there? I didn't do that. Okay, and that is, if you do the math, inch pounds. <clears throat> All right, sound good? All right, now, let's look at our beam. So our beam looks like this. And we probably should state it for the example, but we'll say that it's being bent about this direction, where this is the 10 inches and this is the 3 inches. Now going back to what I was saying earlier uh, when we looked at moments of inertia, remember you know, like a 2 by 4 it's stronger one way than it is another just because of the orientation because it has a larger moment of inertia about that direction. So speaking of moments of inertia, help me out. What is the moment of inertia for a rectangle? See, if this was a composite shape, we'd have to go through and set up the table, and you know, if we had holes and triangles, we have to set up the table and do the parallel axis theorem. But this is just a rectangle. We don't need to do all of that. What is the moment of inertia of a rectangle? Is it too early? Say it again. BH cubed over 12. Remember, moments of inertia come out in inches to the fourth. So this is going to be 3 times 10 inches to the third over 12, which comes out to be, let's see, that's 3 over 12, so that's 0 0.25 times 10 cubed, which is 1,000, 250. Sound good? Now help me out. What's the extreme fiber distance going to be? The C value. How far is it from the centroid of that rectangle to the way tippy tippy top of the section? Five inches. How far is it from the centroid to the way very, very bottom of the section? Five inches. In other words, we don't have to look at the stresses on the top and the bottom. We can just look at the stresses 
either way. The only difference is the sign. One's going to be in compression, one's going to be in tension. So we'll say C top equals C bottom equals C, if you want to call it that, which is just H over 2. So therefore, we can calculate a section modulus, and I like to write my section moduluses with this little hatch because I, I get worried that my S's look like fives. So do that, it comes out to be 50 cubic inches, especially since I got folks making fun of my handwriting. Not going to live it down, man. I'm just saying. <laughs> All right. Sound good? So I can compute bending stresses pretty easily. Okay. So therefore, sigma max, and I'll say sigma max for problem 18, is just going to be M over SX. So that is, uh, what is that, 144? I said 144, and then I started writing 140. Inch pounds over 50 cubic inches. So what are the units going to be when I do all that? P PSI, exactly. Exactly what it should be, right? We're talking about a stress. So what do you get when you do all that? Can you all do some work at 8.30 in the morning? Man, I am horrible. Yep, there you go, 2880. 2880 PSI. What does that mean? That's the maximum stress, but if you're the designer. How would you feel about that number? What, what would you feel about that number? Good, because it's less than sigma allowable, which is 4,000. So that's fine. Now, sigma max for 19, we'll see what happens there. So moment over section modulus which is, in this case, 465. What does that come out to be? 9300. Now, what does that mean? No good. Now, you usually see NG on calcs. Most engineers know what that means, and OK. OK and NG, that's sort of our convention. So I'm curious, since you all are a bunch of engineers in this room, if that happened, what would you do? If you've got to fix this beam, how would you fix it? The beam is inadequate, so what do you do? Okay, that, that, that's a good point. We haven't, we haven't mentioned factors of safety with this problem. So let's say, let's, how about this? Let's say that the factor of safety was built into that sigma allowable. Okay, so let's say that's taken care of, that the factor of safety issue is done and over with. You're the engineer, you've got to fix it. How are you going to fix it? Okay, that, that's another, that, that's a very good point. Let's say that this is a floor beam in a building, okay, and here's the moments. Maybe an answer is to use the same floor beam, just use more of them. You use more floor beams, the spacing between them gets smaller. If the spacing between them gets smaller, less load goes to each floor beam. That is a very valid answer. Okay, give me another one. Okay, that okay, that's okay. So, so you said adding stiffener plates. Well, I'll say this: from a mechanics perspective, adding stiffeners across the section is only going to perform it or in, improve its shear performance, not its bending performance, because. Those stiffeners, what they're trying to do is prevent the web from failing. So the more of them that you include, the better the web performs. But most of your bending occurs in your top and bottom flanges. 
So it, doesn't, it won't really help your bending. And keep in mind, this is just a wooden rectangle. So, you know, where would you put stiffeners or how, how would you do that? Okay, all right, that's a good question. All right, that, he, he said make the beam larger, make it a 10 by 7. Okay? Now, what you. For that, that's a good question. All right, so, so let's, let's talk about the math there. Okay? What happens if you decrease the 10? Well, if the, if the beam gets shallower, what happens to the moment of inertia? Exactly. So think like if you look here, if I make 10 smaller, this gets smaller. If this gets smaller, that's going to get smaller. And if that gets smaller, my stresses get bigger. You need to make the beam bigger. Okay. Now, you had mentioned earlier making the beam wider. Okay. There, exactly. There you go. Make the beam taller. Okay make the beam taller. If you make the beam taller, then you know, the moment of inertia jumps substantially because it's, because the, it's proportional to the height cubed. Okay? Now, what if you've got clearance requirements? What if you've only got 10 inches of room to work with? Then you go into your solution or your solution. Your solution was to make the beam wider and your solution in a roundabout way was to th put more beams in place. And that's a possibility as well. There's another option that, that isn't quite being thought out. I want to see if anybody can. Different material. There you go. What, use a different species of wood, you know, with better properties, you know. Instead of using uh, uh, Douglas fir, use Georgia pine. You know, maybe it's got better properties. Mm-hmm. You're starting to get into timber design. How do you handle all that? All right. Yeah. No, no, that's a good question. Timber design is a topic in and of itself. Like at Marshall, we teach structural seal design and we teach reinforced concrete design. Timber design could be its whole other class. And without getting too much into timber design, here, here's the long and short of it. So if you're designing, let's say, a wooden beam, you start off by recognizing what species of wood it is. Okay. And then you go to the NDS, which is basically the specification put out by the American Wood Council. They're the folks who write. That comes from just data collection over years and years and years. Something like that. Something like. That. <laughs> but let let me say this. So, um, you take a piece of visually graded lumber, right? And it's got, let's say it's Douglas fir. Okay, Douglas fir has certain intrinsic nominal properties associated with it. Like regardless of what's going on, here's the maximum usable bending stress associated with Douglas fir. Here's the maximum tensile stress, the maximum compressive stress, whatever. And you look all that up. And then you take that F sub B, let's say a bending stress, and you multiply it by about 8 billion adjustment factors to count for wet service factor, load duration, beam stability. I mean, when you look at the timber, like the base timber equation, you'll have like F sub B times C sub B, C sub D, C sub T, C sub B, da, 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 all these different factors that are trying to account for everything you're talking about to obtain an F sub B prime, like a usable bending stress value. And then you would take that bending stress value and that would basically be sigma allowable. And then once you get that, you do all of this and see whether or not it works. And if not, redesign. Now, not to, to delve into timber so much, but has anybody ever heard of a glue lamb beam? Okay, a glue lamb beam stands for a glued laminated timber beam. And the idea is instead of having a solid wooden section, you have a bunch of layers of, of sheets of wood that you press together and glue and make a, a composite beam. Okay? You see it a lot in, in uh, places like churches, uh, ski lodges, you know, residential construction, places like that. Okay? Now, let me ask you this. Let's you know, think of this a little conceptually. If, I have, if I'm designing a glue lamb beam, okay, and I've got multiple species of wood, and we'll say I've got crappy wood and really, really good wood, okay? do I put my crappy wood in the middle of the beam or do I put my crappy wood near the ends? in the middle. 
Why do I put it in the middle? It doesn't see that much stress. I put my really, really good sheets on the top and bottom where they're seeing the most bending stress. Make sense? Now, that concept, whether you're a civil or a mechanical, that, that's still important because if you're designing a, a composite beam or you're using some cold form section that's going to be, you know, in the wing of some airplane or whatnot, you still need to make sure that you're proportioning that beam so that it's performing well according to fundamental bending principles, right? Put your stronger stuff on the ends. Make sense? All right, everybody good? Run? No. <laughs> um, let me say this. You are, what you're indirectly talking about is, is some more advanced beam topics. Um, I'll answer your question this way because this is the only way I could think of where engineers take advantage of something like you're talking about. Um, when you're designing a composite bridge or, or a, a continuous span bridge, a continuous span bridge is a bridge that's indeterminate. Okay? It's got too many unknowns and you have equations of equilibrium. There is a provision in the spec where we actually allow the region that's at the pier to fail a little bit. And what happens is when that region that's there at the pier, so imagine you've got a two-span bridge, you've got abutment, abutment, and you've got a pier right in the middle. When right there at the pier, when it begins to fail, it loses the ability to carry moment. So what it does is it takes that moment and it shifts it back to the positive bending regions, to the main part of the span. Okay? And the, the, the justification for doing that is it allows you to balance out your moments a little bit and it improves your design. Instead of using a one and a half inch flange, maybe you can use a one and a quarter inch flange by, by taking that into account. And that phenomenon is called moment redistribution. So we actually take, a, we take into account the ability, you know, we allow the, the pier to fail a little bit. Because in actuality, whether you like it or not, there is some yielding there. You, you can't get around it. It's going to happen. So why not take advantage of it? Okay. But, so, so there is that. But if you're talking about just a simply supported beam, you know, just by itself, and it, you're starting to exceed bending stresses, and you're starting to see cracking or yielding or buckling, run. <laughs> I'm, I'm serious. You don't want that to happen. Because think about this from, from statics. That's a determinate structure. If you start hinging or start um, experiencing a localized point of failure, it becomes unstable. And if grandma's driving over that bridge, then she's in the river, and I, and I don't want grandma in the river. But, this, <laughs> that, but that's important. I mean, I, I'm serious. This is good stuff, okay? Anybody else have any questions? This is, this is important, so. Everybody good? All right. Um, you are right. That, that is one of the fundamental principles behind pre-stress is that concrete is a material that behaves very, very poorly in tension. So I'm going to answer your question by going back to the PowerPoint a little bit. Um, concrete is a material that behaves pretty poorly in tension when you compare it to its compressive capacity. So if I can take a concrete beam and I can lock in a whole bunch of compressive force, then this tension down here starts to decrease. So if there's less tension in the beam, I can make it smaller. That's the whole principle behind pre-stressed concrete. And, and, I mean, that's how it works. The downside to it, uh, well, l let me say this. You can also make the beam smaller, so, so don't get me wrong. There are upsides, and there's more upsides than down, which is why it's used so much. But there is one downside to using pre-stress that makes it a little more complicated, and that's over time, those stresses dissipate. Okay? Concre I mean, think, if you lock that in and leave that beam there for 50 years, you telling me if you lock 250 kips in on day one that it's going to be 250 kips 50 years from now? Now, some of those stresses, they dissipate. You've got creep in the concrete. The strands want to relax. I mean, to, to give you an idea, and I don't want to get too far, um, how many of you play guitar or play bass or something like that? Okay. What do you have to do to your guitar every now and then? Tune it. Why? The strings lose some of their force. Now think about this from a mechanics perspective. You're talking about a, a, an element that has a constant length that's being subjected to a constant force, but over time that force dissipates. But the length doesn't change. 
That's called relaxation. That happens because the, the crystalline structure of the metals inside the string, they realign and that force dissipates over time and then you got to retighten that. You can't really retighten a, a pretension concrete beam. Those forces are just going to dissipate. So you have to account for that. And then there's environmental impacts, you know, anchorage slip, all that stuff you've got to account for. But yeah, you can do that. And that's one of the big advantages. And the reason why is really because of this. If we increase this compressive force, maybe we can get rid of some of that tension. But that's really the main philosophy behind that. It's a really, it's a nifty topic. It was a lot of fun uh, taking that class. And it's a lot of fun doing that type of design because you really, you know, get to think uh, outside of the box a little bit. It's not so much, okay, the, um, you need to recognize that those forces are going to dissipate. And um, there are models to estimate how much it's going to dissipate. So basically, in, in pre-stress, you'll calculate a piece of I, which is the initial force that you put on it. But when you do your design calcs, you, you use a piece of E, an effective you know, uh, force. And the difference between the two might be like 85%. So you might say 15% of those forces are gone, and you're left with only 85. And that's the whole point of the loss estimation, trying to figure out how much is going away. And there are models that you can use to do that. So they're a little involved, but you can do it. Any other questions? This is good stuff. This is the stuff I like. Engineers taking charge of their education and learning something. You think I'm going to complain about that? Goodness. This is good stuff. Any questions? All right. Now, I'm a steel guy, so we're going to have a steel problem in here. Um, I chose this problem because it will help us master the bending stress formula a little bit more. But um, I also want to introduce you to some terminology and I want to make sure you understand the coordinate systems and bending directions and all this stuff because this stuff matters. Okay. Now, you probably know the answer to this question since you work at West Virginia Steel, so you don't get to answer this. I'm curious if anybody else knows this. I've got here a W14 by 53. I'm curious, does anybody know what the 14 and the 53 means? You need to put your hand up. Okay, you're, you're close, okay? The 14 is about how deep it is, about, okay? Now, if you actually go through and look at the tabulated dimensions, it might be 14.1, or it might be 13.9, or something like that. But the 14 is about how deep it is, okay? Now, the 53, any guesses on what the 53 means? Can you keep Go ahead. No, no, because you, you can ultimately you can cut these to any length. The 53 is how heavy it is. 53 would mean that a, four, a W14 by 53 is a, is a section that's 14 inch, about 14 inches deep, and it weighs 53 pounds per foot. Okay. Now the W stands for the class of shape that you're talking about. So a C, a C is a channel, a C shape. W. W stands for what's called a wide flange section. And basically, W, if you want to think, think I-beam. A W is an I shape, okay? Now, there's a whole laundry list of shapes that are in the steel manual. Um, and I don't, believe me, I don't expect you to remember every one. But I do expect you to at least understand what's going on. So I've got this set of uh, tables that's in your textbook. So if you miss one, no big deal. It's in your textbook. This is Appendix F. Yeah, I think it's Appendix F. Where's that? Oh. I'll leave the sign-in sheet right here. Is there anybody that didn't get a chance to sign it? I know, I think it sort of missed you. Did, did you get the sign-in sheet? I think I think it missed you because you had sat down and it went the other way. Okay. So let me pull this up digitally so that we can all take a look at it. Um, here we go. Okay. Now first off, one of the things that you will see is uh, I've got table F1A which is in U.S. units and then F1B, which is an SI, it's literally the same table, okay? Now, 
Let's sort of take a look at this to make sure we understand what's going on. Okay, so we've got the designation W30 by 211. We'll just sort of take one of these. So it weighs about 211 pounds per foot. Area, that's if I cut a samurai sword through the section, look at it, that is the, area, the total area of the shape, okay? Depth. Okay, this is what I was talking about before. It's a W30, which means it's about 30 inches deep, but that's all about the rolling process when they roll these shapes. In actuality, the design depth that you would use for your calculations is about 30.9. Now, does everybody know what I mean when I say the difference between the flange and the web? Okay, the, the web is the center portion of your eye shape, and the web is primarily the, the component that resists shear in most major axis bending cases. These two components are the flanges. Okay, so that's just a little bit of terminology so everybody knows what's going on. Make sense? Okay. If you're dealing with an angle like an L shape, we just call those legs, the legs of the angle. Okay. So the section is 30.9 inches deep. That's from the way tippy tippy top to the way bottom. Okay. The web thickness, so it would be 0.775 inches thick. That's how thick that web is. Okay. The flange. The flange is 15.1 inches wide, and it's 1.32 inches thick. Make sense? Okay. Now, axis 1-1 one, one and axis 2-2. Two, two. Let's sort of hold off on the axes for a second, but I want to show you something. So we've got I, moment of inertia. We've got S, section modulus, and we've got this term R. Now, R stands for the radius of gyration. That's something we haven't dealt with yet. We will talk about that later, but I'll say this. R is a uh, dimension that we're going to use later on in the semester when we look at columns that want to buckle. Ra the radius of gyration it comes into, uh, into play then when we look at buckling. <coughs> now, I've got axis 1-1 one, one, and I've got axis 2-2. Two, two. What's going on here? Okay. Let's look at this image below, or above, sorry, above. Okay, so here's the I-beam, and I've got axis 1-1 one, one and axis 2-2, two, two, okay? Now, axis 1-1, one, one, we say, is this horizontal axis. So imagine I'm taking the beam, you know, and I'm walking across it. If I'm bending about axis 1-1, one, one, I'm saying that I'm literally walking on this top plane. So I'm sort of walking on it like this, okay? Now, we call this direction the strong direction. I mean, think. When you look at beams in buildings or beams in bridges, they're sitting upright like this, right? They're not turned over looking like an H, right? Make sense? So, in other words, if I'm, let's see if I can write here. So bending about 1-1 one, one would look like this, would be, test my 3D art skills a little bit. Bending about 1-1 one, one would be something like this, and we've got our supports. Something like this. And we have our load being subjected like this. In other words, the beam is being bent the way it wants to be bent. Make sense? That is what we call the strong axis, okay? I mean, just look at the numbers, okay? Like if I look at this, the moment of inertia about the 1-1 one, one axis, the strong axis is like 10,300. About the weak axis, it's only 757. I-beams are much stronger about the strong axis than they are about the weak axis. That's why we call them strong and weak axis. Make sense? Now, when I say that's bending about the 1-1 one, one axis, okay, let me write it over here. Bending, I should have planned this out and switched them over. Bending about 2-2 two, two would be more like this. would be something like this, and then the load being applied like that. I-beams are much more flimsy in that direction than they are in this direction. And when possible, we don't like this to happen. We would prefer that beams be bent like this. But sometimes we can't avoid it. 
for instance, if we've got a, a column in a building, so behind that little partition right there, there's a column, right? And so it's being subjected to loads going down like this, okay? But it's also going to be pushed from side to side because on a day like today, it might get a little windy, right? When it gets windy, it's going to be pushed laterally and that section's going to bend. It might bend like this. I, I can't control what the wind's going to do, right? Make sense? Everybody okay with that? Okay. Um, it depends. <laughs> um, it, de it depends on two things. It depends on one, where you're at. The wind load here is different than the wind load in Miami, guaranteed. What's up? Yeah, especially a week ago <laughs> with, with Matthew coming in. Okay, that's number one. But number two, it also depends on the height of the building. Wind loads on a building like this would not be as substantial on a building like Smith. What you find with wind dynamics is the taller a building gets, the worse the wind load is. I mean, Burj Khalifa, phew, wind loads like crazy, okay? That, that, that's just a, a fact that wind loads, they, they vary much more with height. It's almost parabolic. In fact, it is parabolic, so, okay? That makes sense? And, and, there's, and there's one other big lateral event that can happen to a building. What's that? An earthquake. <coughs> and we obviously can't control that, yeah. Now, we don't have to worry about it too much here, but you go out to California, sorry, <coughs> excuse me, or even like Western Kentucky, you got to deal with them there too, so. Uh, any questions? Okay, this is a formula I really want you all to understand and, and, under, and grasp the mechanics of it, because this is important stuff, okay, make sense? Okay, so now that you all have that, let's see if we can do a little bit of math with it. All right, what's all right, I'm going to erase this. Huh, me that way. <coughs> okay. So, what I'm trying to figure out is this. I've got a bending moment of 10 foot kips, and it's being applied to these various cross sections. I want to determine what the stresses would be. So, I've got a W14 by 53, but it's being bent about both the strong axis and the weak axis. So if I take that same moment and bend it about the strong axis versus bending about the weak axis, what's the, uh, what's the capacity or what's the ultimate stresses? And also I want to look at a C15 by 50. So you all should have those properties in front of you. Let's, let's do a little bit of figuring with that. Let's see what we can come up with. All right. <coughs> oh, goodness. And we might not finish this example, that's fine. I don't want to rush this. All right. So first off, our moment is 10 foot kips. Okay, I can do better than that. Now, all of our section properties that you see in that table are listed in inches. So I probably need to convert this to inches. So what should I do? D multiply by 12. There we go. And if you want, you could multiply by 1,000 and turn this into PSI, but whether your stresses come out in PSI or KSI really isn't that big of a deal, so I'm just going to leave it like this. All right, so let's take this one step at a time, and the first thing I want to look at is the W14 by 153. Was it 153 or 53? 53, sorry. Okay. What you find in steel design, this is just food for thought for later, but your W8s, W10s, W12s, and W14s are by and large your more square type sections, and those tend to be used more for columns, because columns are, tend, tend to be square. Beam sections tend to be really deep, so just food for thought. Okay, all right. Now, a W shape or an I shape is symmetric about both directions, right? So regardless of if I bend it about the strong axis or bend it about the weak axis, it's symmetric. So I really only need to get the section moduli. So help me out. What's the section moduli for the strong axis and what's the, what's the section moduli for the, oh, let me do better than that. What's the section moduli for the weak axis?
77.8. Now, what are the units? And remember, a section modulus is in a way a measure of its, you know, its capacity. Okay. Um, since the 1, 1 is the larger value, that's the strong axis. So we can determine for part A, bending about the strong axis, we can just say that sigma top equals sigma bottom. And that's just going to be 120 uh, inch kips over 77.8 inches cubed. And what does that come out to be? One point five four two, something like that. What are the units? KSI. So if we want, we can say that's an answer. We can say that's A. Now for part B, it's the same story. And then we take that and we divide it by 14.3. And what do we get here? <coughs> Okay, 8.392. So think about it like this. Just by taking an I-beam and bending it the other way, the stresses jump up dramatically. You know what I mean? Dramatically. So it's something that as an engineer you really need to consider. Okay. Yeah, I think we got time for this. All right. Now, for the I-shape, I'm going to do the, or for, for the C-shape, sorry, for the channel. I'm going to do the channel a little differently. I'm going to do it a little more involved, if you will. Uh, in other words, I might do it the long way. But I'm doing it so because I really want you to understand the mechanics of the, the equation that we just derived because it's, uh, it's pretty fundamental. Okay, so I'm going to ask for a few dimensions for the, uh, for the I shape or for the C shape. So it's a what? C 15 by 50. Okay. So let's see. So I'm on table F3A. Would you help me out with a couple things? All right. Now what I want is this. First off, what is the depth? 15.0 inches, even. Okay. What else? I want you to tell me what is the moment of inertia about the strong axis. Fifty-three point what eight? I want moment of inertia because I'm gonna do this one the long way. And oh, oh. I was going to say, that did seem a little low. Okay. Now, I'm going to ask you for a couple other things. All right. I want you to tell me the following. I want you to tell me B sub F. And B sub F, that is the flange width. Okay. I want you to tell me the moment of inertia about the weak axis. And I want you to tell me this distance C. Does everybody see that? Everybody good? What's that? Well, 
Oh, R isn't going to be on the diagram at all. It's, if you want to know how to calculate R, I'll go ahead and tell you. You just take the moment of inertia, divide it by the area, and then take the square root of all that. And then that'll give you R. But R shows up later. We don't, do, we don't really need to, we don't need R right now. I mean, we could, I could show you it. But it's only going to become a relevant value when we look at, um, at columns. And here's the reason why I'll go ahead and say this. Would it make sense that a column gets weaker the longer it is? In other words, the longer a column gets, the more slender it gets, right? But how, what, what's slenderness? How do you compute slenderness? I propose to you that we calculate slenderness by saying how long it is divided by its radius of gyration. So L over R is a measure of slenderness, so. But we'll get to that later. All right. Sound good? Okay, all right. Let's deal with part C, okay, because I really want to... I really want to get, dig into the mechanics. Okay, so part C, I've got the channel like this. And it is being bent about that line, right? About its centroid. So what can you tell me about the stresses on the top and the stresses on the bottom? They're equal, right? All right, now. What can you tell me about this distance here and this distance? And what are they? 7.5. They're D over 2, right? So, so I propose that another way we can compute sigma top and sigma bottom is to take m times d over 2 divided by the moment of inertia. m y over i, right? Instead of shortcutting it with the section modulus. So we have a bending moment of 120 inch kips. We have 7.5 inches. And there we go. Now, we could take M over S and just do that. that. I'm not saying we couldn't do that, but I wanted to go through this exercise for the channel because you'll see why. You'll see why. So what do we get? Sound about right? Anybody else getting that? All right, any questions? Okay. All right, has everybody got this? Because I'm probably going to need the next slide. Okay. Now, for part D, I'm doing something a little differently. For part D, I've got the channel like this. And I'm bending the channel about its weak axis, which is something about like this. Make sense? Now, let's pay attention to some things. What is this dimension right here? Well, no, 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 th think, think. It wouldn't be the half, because remember, I'm looking at this. That's the whole flange width, right? This is the B sub F, yeah. <clears throat> so, this is B sub F which is 2.72, is that what you said? 3.72. Make sense? Now, 
what is, well here, let me just fill this in. Let's fill this in. Now what is this top dimension right here? What is this? What is that dimension? From, from here to here, what is that? What's that? No, you can't. Look at your diagram above. Look at the diagram above. That's C, right? This dimension is C. Oh, goodness. About to erase that. This is C, which is 0 0.779, right? 799. That's 799. So how would I calculate this? This is... Something like that, yeah, BF minus C. Does that make sense? Okay, here's why. Tell me this. How am I going to compute the stress on the top? Tell me what to do. It's sigma equals MY over I, right? So it's M divided by I, which is I22, and what's the distance? How far is it from the centroid? to the way tippy tippy top of the section. C. Okay, all right. Now, before we plug and chug, help me out with this. How we do how do we do sigma for the bottom? Well it's M Y over I. M divided by the moment of inertia. And then what's the distance? How do I go from the centroid to the way, way down at the bottom? There we go. So, I'll let you all plug and chug. Well, here, we'll fill it in real quick. So, I got 120 times 0 0.799, 11.0 inches to the fourth, 120, 3.72, minus that over 11.0 inches to the fourth. Now, I'll go ahead and tell you, when you plug and chug, you're going to get 8.716 KSI here, but down here, you're going to get 31.865. Yeah, you can look at it two ways. Number one, you can look at it that this distance is much farther. So the stresses are going to get larger. That's one way you can look at it. Another way that you can look at it is there's just more material to resist the stress above the centroid than there is below the centroid. So because there's less material to resist that stress, there's more stress. Make sense? This is good stuff. This is, the, this is really critical. I hope, hope that you all got a lot out of today. Any, anybody have any questions? That's all I've got for you this week. You all have a good weekend. Remember, your homework is due next Tuesday. All right, that's all I got. Y'all have a good one.